Denver has an important choice. Tonight, the two candidates in the race for mayor take on the biggest issues facing the city, safety in our schools. I am angry at the leadership of Denver Public Schools. Rising housing costs. Affordability is a crisis. And an overwhelming surge of migrants. Denver cannot continue to financially shoulder this burden alone. Kelly Bruff, former chief of staff for Denver mayor, is vying to be the first woman in that office. And Mike Johnston, a former state senator with nearly eight years in the legislature. Presented by Denver 7, the Denver Post, Colorado Public Radio, and Denverite. Live from Denver 7 Studios, here are your moderators, Ann Trujillo, Joe Rubino, and Desiree Mathrin. And good evening to all of you. Welcome to tonight's debate. Tonight we will hear from the candidates for Denver's mayoral race. Election day, as you know, is June 6th. So let us first welcome the candidates, Kelly Bruff and Mike Johnston. So we thank you both for being here. We appreciate it. Now, now we first want to go over a few rules for you. Candidates, you will have 60 seconds to respond to most questions. 30 seconds for any possible follow-ups from us. We do have a countdown clock, so if a candidate runs over time, they will hear a ding sound. If your opponent references you in his or her answer, you will get 30 seconds for a rebuttal. And just for fun, there will be short yes or no questions scattered throughout the debate. So let us please begin. So prior to the debate, a coin flip decided who will go first. The first question we know is for Mike Johnston. So Joe Rubino with the Denver Post has that question. You both released tax documents to the Denver Post as part of this campaign. Kelly, you reported a 2021 income of about $272,000. Mike, you reported a joint income with your wife of $603,000 in 2021. With those respective incomes, what makes you think you were in touch with Denver's working families who on average are making $94,000 a year? Thank you so much for having me and for the conversation tonight. Yeah, I've spent uh, the last two decades of my career serving working families all across the city of Denver. I started my career as a teacher and a school principal uh, know what it's like to be able to live on those salaries and have to be able to try to support a family in the city. Spent time as a state senator uh, where it is also not a well-paid job. I was fortunate the last couple of years to work at a foundation and have the chance to lead it there. But all of my career has been focused on how we make sure we can support those families who are farthest from opportunity. That means for me, uh, making sure everybody has access to a livable wage. It means making sure they have access to affordable housing and make sure you can get access to things that we know are driving up costs like childcare. Uh, and so I think that experience has been a huge benefit for me, including the more than 10 years I spent with the community office up in North Park Hill, uh, where neighbors could come in and out of my office every day to talk about the issues that were most relevant for them. I think that service and that connection to community for me is a real driver for the policies I wanna take on as the mayor. Kelly? Thanks for asking. Joe, I think for me, you know, my family grew up and uh, I re received assistance when I was a kid. So my family knows what it's like to work multiple jobs and still need help to put food on a, your table and keep a roof over your head. When I first moved to Denver for probably the first 20 or 25 years, uh, my husband and I struggled. Uh, we were probably making maybe the median, um, but in that time we could still buy a home. Uh, my parents helped care for our kids because we couldn't afford childcare. Uh, we too worked multiple jobs to try to figure out how to make ends meet and find a path forward. The difference today though is, and the next mayor has to focus on this, is I believe today's residents should have the same exact opportunities, where you can buy a home again in the city that you're working hard, where you can afford childcare, and I know we can assist with that, where you can feel safe in your neighborhoods and your kids get the education they deserve in Denver Public Schools. Those are the things I'll focus on for Denver's working families. Well, in fact, we want to talk about housing right now. Denver has a housing crisis. We do have a series of questions under this topic. First, Denver's building permits office has struggled to catch up on serious backlogs that delay development, including for affordable housing projects. So former mayoral candidate Robert Treda owns a construction company. He tweeted out, quote, I'll give the new mayor six months to straighten out the building permit mess. And after that, I don't care anymore. I'll be starting projects in Denver without a permit. I will also encourage all my contractor friends to do the same. So what two things could you do to bring that office up to expectations? Kelly, you go first. Yeah, I'll start. And I also want to say former candidate Treda has endorsed me and I'm grateful. And I take his challenge seriously. There's two things I would do. Denver is significantly behind today. And the reason this is so critical is this not only costs money on those uh, apartments that are being built, 
but it costs money for Colorado Coalition for the Homeless, for Habitat for Humanity, for affordable housings we're trying to build in our city. I would bring in contractors. There's companies who can help us catch up and really get behind that backlog, which is overwhelming. The second thing I'd do is restructure the department. Today, it's very siloed. We have multiple departments from the Department of Forestry, the Building Code, the Planning Department, the Fire Department, the Transportation Department, all trying to coordinate this work. I'd make it one team with one person in charge of it, really focused on delivering customer service and making sure we get that housing done more efficiently and more cost effectively. Mike, how would you respond? Yeah, I think the most important thing here that we see every day is we can't afford a Denver where Denverites can't afford to live. Right now, we know the very residents who are serving this city, the teachers, nurses, firefighters, servers, 80% of those folks can't afford to live in this city tonight. And that is a dramatic problem we have to solve. And we're making that problem worse by having a permitting process that is so slow that it drives up the cost of those units and it makes us wait longer and longer to get those units built. So that was one of the reasons why I helped build a coalition of organizations around the state to take on our first statewide ballot measure to take on affordable housing. That was Proposition 123, which passed last year. And a key part of that is not just putting $300 million a year each year into expanding more affordable housing. It's actually forcing cities and counties to move faster in the permitting process. So I would use those regulations to push to get a 90-day fast-track approval process in Denver for affordable units. So we know we can push those affordable projects to the front of the line. We can get them moving. We can get them built. We can get people housed in the units that they know they can afford and they can afford to stay in. Thank you both for those answers. Desiree Matherin with Denverite has our next question. You both endorse permanent supportive housing and short-term housing. However, it, we've seen in places like Los Angeles that neighborhoods are pushing back against building these types of communities. Will you guarantee that supportive housing will be in every district? If so, how will you deal with pushback? Uh, Mike can go first. Right, uh, thank you. Yeah, I think that one of the things we know is that if we are going to be able to make this city more affordable, we have to build more affordable units. I've committed a, a vision to build 25,000 units that are permanently affordable over the next eight years. And that would allow people who live in those units to not have to pay more than 30% of what they make to rent. And so if you're a teacher making $40,000 a year, you don't have to pay more than $1,000 a month. And you don't have to worry your rent's going to get jacked up each month because your rent doesn't go up unless your income goes up. And that allows us to bring density and to bring supportive housing around the city. I think we do want to focus on the places where we have access to public transit. We have access to light rail or to buses so we can have uh, more dense housing that don't always require everyone to have a car because they have an easy and convenient way to get to work. So I think we want to bring affordable housing to all of the regions of Denver, but we also want to prioritize those places that have the best access to transit as places where we can build the greatest density. And that's what I would work with neighborhoods to do. Kelly? Yeah, to make a city work, we have to have a range of housing throughout our city. Uh, and the most important decision the next mayor can make is work with city council on our land use. And this is where we have to build density, where we've already made investments in our transit system, but our major bus routes. And this isn't just for affordability, this is also for our environment, for transportation reasons, air quality reasons, water usage. So you'll see my administration really focus on building that more affordable housing, not just rent, but for sale as well, throughout our city, in every neighborhood, so that we're building where we should have density, but we're also building so our kids can access schools they never could have accessed, families can own homes in neighborhoods they never could have afforded, and I will look at publicly owned land to be able to deliver that product so it's more, to more affordable, like a land bank or a land trust, and it will be throughout our city. I just want to be clear that I heard an answer because the question was, will you guarantee that supportive housing will be in every district? Is that a yes from both of you? For yes. affordable housing in every district, yes. yes. If you mean council districts, I assume. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. yes. All right, thank you. We're going to move on to homelessness now. Uh, last month, the city auditor released a report saying Denver is spending more than it's reporting on homelessness. Three million on enforcement, eight million on outreach, and two and a half million on cleanups for a total of about $13 million, a number that is likely much bigger. So we have a question for each of you. Kelly, with that audit number in mind, you've said the use of arrest would be an option as a last resort. Do you stand by that? And knowing that there is a shortage of Denver police and sheriffs, where will the resources to arrest people come from? Yeah, really, uh, it is a last resort. The priority, and I really have to emphasize what the auditor is focused on in his audit, is the cost of continually sweeping people and how ineffective that is. 
And so I'm proposing we actually stop doing that and instead, with urgency, we get people to safer, safe outdoor sites, indoor when we can, but safe outdoor sites. So we stop sweeping people and we actually start to save lives. Uh, in that process, if somebody refuses to go or more importantly, isn't capable of making that decision for themselves, I have said I would take them to a place like Denver Cares that we have today. This is a facility for someone who's intoxicated or high and can't take care of themselves. And I would take people to those locations to take care of them through this process. Okay, Joe has a next question for Mike. Mike, your plan to address homelessness includes building micro communities of tiny homes. How do you prioritize who gets first pick of those units? Uh, thanks for the question, Joe. And um, I'm glad to come back to this. I don't think uh, arresting people who are homeless is the answer. I think the answer is getting people access to housing, getting people access to housing that have the supportive services we know uh, people need. Uh, example is I was talking to a guy outside of a shelter a few weeks ago uh, who had a construction hat in his bag and was saying that he's been working construction but ended up homeless again after 11 months of work because he had to choose between going to get a shift for construction at 5.30 in the morning or going to the methadone clinic where he's getting treatment to get off his addiction. And because he had to choose treatment, he missed the shift, couldn't pay the rent, was back on the street. That's not someone that needs to be arrested. That's someone that needs access to housing, needs access to services, needs access to support. What we know is that if we create this kind of housing, Joe, we know there's people who want to go there in overwhelming numbers. And so that's why we want to build this scale quickly. These tiny homes can be built quickly. We can convert hotels quickly. That allows us to move people to those sites that we know they overwhelmingly want to go. And so for me, that's how we solve it and we can solve it with real speed. Thank you. All right, here's Des with the next question. You both have produced plans of addressing our unhoused community members. So this next question comes from the Sun Valley Community Coalition. What is your plan to address the need for affordable housing for low income Denverites and missing middle that does not displace current residents? And Mike can go first. I'm so glad that you raised this because this is what we're finding is there is a huge gap of affordable housing, not just for folks that are unhoused, but for people that are working full jobs, sometimes two full jobs and still can't get access to housing. This is why it's so important to make sure we have housing that we can guarantee people is affordable and will stay affordable. So uh, my proposal will build these 25,000 units or convert existing units to be permanently affordable. So people can get access to them at any income level. If you're making 20,000 a year or 30,000 a year or 60,000 a year, we know we have families that are married couples making 80,000 a year that still can't afford to raise kids in this city. And this links your rent to what you're actually making. And so you don't have a scenario where someone's paying 50% of what they make to income, or sorry, to rent. That's what's happening around the city right now. And that's what's making it possible for people to stay uh, in this city. For, so for me, that priority is about meeting people at whatever income level they're at and making sure they can get access to housing that doesn't burden them and keep them from being able to pay for food for their kids or transportation or the rest of the medication or core services families need. Kelly. This is so key because I think we have to start thinking about housing as the continuum that it really is. So while I, I'll focus on you know, hardworking families and how we make sure they stay, I'm gonna tie it back to this is all part of how we also address unhoused in our city and prevent it. And so for me, I think what has worked in other cities that I think is extremely promising is something called master leasing, where either your housing authority or a nonprofit we would create would start to master lease. In essence, negotiate leases in mass. And we'd be able to pass that reduced rent and hold it flat for years to our own residents. We know two things about that. One, it allows us to rehouse people who are unhoused today. And over 40% are estimated to have jobs, so we know that will help us. Uh, but it also allows hardworking families to not lose their homes and prevent homelessness because in that instance the master lease signer gets a phone call before someone's evicted and we start to get ahead of the challenge we face today all right thank you both our next topic covers the overwhelming surge of migrants city's chief financial officer estimates the city will have spent up to 20 million dollars caring for migrants by next month with more than 10,000 migrants arriving in the city. And Denver's spending about $1,000 per week per migrant. Now the federal government has reimbursed less than 1 million of that, forcing the city to rely on community partnerships to help people. So what more should the city be doing to curb these costs? And Kelly, we'll let you start this question. Yeah, I got the chance in December when we had the first influx of migrants to volunteer at Rudy Park Rec Center and see firsthand the incredible response our city has conducted. And frankly, we should all be proud of what we've done. Uh, but I think as you point out, Anne, it is not sustainable what we're doing today. So a few things we can do differently. 
It's estimated about 70% of the migrants coming to our city today are actually trying to get to another city. So this is where I think we have to ask the federal government to start coordinating at the border so we actually get people where they're trying to go and they're not being shuffled around our nation uh, because that's a huge part of that expense today. But the second reality is we're telling people who are coming here seeking refugee status uh, that uh, it will take months and months, best case probably six, and years before we know if they receive that status in our nation. And meanwhile, you can't work. My priority will be allowing people to work until they can find out what their status is. Thank you, Mike. Uh, yeah, I was um, speaking to some of the migrants last week about this and they'll all tell the same story. Everyone came up to me and said, hey, where can I find a job? Where can I find a place to work? I, I, I wanna work, what are the options? And at the same time, I have business leaders calling me and saying, hey, I have so many jobs I can't fill. How can I hire those folks? So the only challenge we have right now is we have people in this country who want to work. We have businesses who want to hire them. And we have a federal government who won't get out of the way to let those employers hire those people who want to get to work. And so uh, I would push President Biden and Secretary Mayorkas to say these folks should have temporary protective status now. They should be able to get to work right now while we're waiting to see what their long-term status is, but it doesn't serve them or us to have them here not able to do what they want, which is to support themselves. Um, and the second is we have to find ways to solve costs as a community. The city doesn't have to do this all on our own. We should reach out to churches and nonprofits and community partners, other regional partners to say, Denver doesn't have to carry all of this cost on our own. We don't have to pay rent at hotels every single night. Where do we have community partners who can help solve this housing? And I think that's a much better way to go about it. Well, which leads us to our next question, Joe. Yes, Mike, you'll be leading this one off. Uh, you know, how, as mayor, would either of you reach out to our neighboring communities uh, to take some of this burden off of our local nonprofits in the city of Denver, the financial burden of, of helping these migrants in the short term? Uh, great question, Joe. And for me, there's a step I do even before that, which is right now I would call El Paso because right now most of these migrants are coming from El Paso and they're being put on a bus to Denver with no knowledge they're coming to Denver or no desire to stay in Denver. We could help ease a lot of this pressure by working with El Paso in advance to say, if you have folks that know they're trying to get to Boston or trying to get to Chicago, let's put them on a bus to Chicago in the first place, not come to Denver as a first stop. And then when we know what that volume is, we can work with our neighboring communities to say, all right, what capacity does Denver have? And what capacity could Colorado Springs have? What capacity could Fort Collins have? What capacity could Grand Junction have? This is what we did after the uh, Katrina in New Orleans, and we knew they were refugees coming to Colorado. We partnered in advance. We worked with other municipalities. We identified locations, and we moved people to places where we knew there was staff and support. We can do the same thing here. It just takes a more proactive approach and more regional partnership to make sure we get it done. Kelly? Yeah, for me, I'd do what I've already done as a candidate. Um, we have a number of organizations. The Metro Mayor's Caucus, I think, is one of the strongest that really brings together all of this region's mayors. Uh, I've met with a number of mayors in this region and I talked with them about my homeless plan and that I believe we actually can't address our unhoused population unless we actually work together. And seven mayors in the metro area have endorsed my homeless plan and me as a candidate. I would do the same kind of work on issues like this and frankly other issues that we face from transportation to air quality to climate issues. We have to do these things as a region. But I would use more than just the Metro Mayor's Caucus. We also have the Colorado Counties Incorporated, CCI. We have the Colorado Municipal League. Those are all structures that are perfectly situated to allow us to come in and begin those partnerships immediately. Thank you both. We're gonna move on to childcare now, that issue. And Desiree has the question. Mm -hmm. In December 2022, the average monthly cost of childcare in Denver was $1,575, a cost burden for many families. But the supply of care is also an issue. For example, there's overwhelming wait lists and the closing of the Wonder Academy in the Golden Triangle neighborhood. Excuse me, in the Golden Triangle neighborhood. What will you do to address the lack of facilities? Kelly, you can start. This is such a huge issue. It was a huge issue for my family as I raised my daughters and it's even more challenging today. And like so many families, frankly, my parents are who saved us and helped us raise our daughters because we couldn't afford childcare in our city. Today, we do have the Denver Preschool Program. It's up for reauthorization in 2026, I think, uh, which means we'll start looking at that reauthorization by 2024. I would start partnering in our community of early childcare providers and talk about if we could move the age down on that given that we now have full day K and preschool uh, support from the state and see if we could get to more families earlier with the financial support and the quality programs that it offers. But here's the real issue. 
we have to address pay. If we're gonna have enough workers to provide the care that we need, we have to address the pay of the workers in this field. And I would work with that same group to come up with solutions to address that issue. Mike? After housing, we know that childcare is the single most difficult cost that families face right now. Uh, and this is one we have to take action on. Uh, I'm proud I've been working on this for the last several years. We actually worked with a broad coalition of leaders around the state uh, to bring universal preschool to Colorado with a 2020 ballot measure. That's gonna make a huge difference for four-year-olds and families' ability to get access to preschool for those four-year-olds. It also means in Denver, we allowed it for them, the Denver preschool program, to move that support down to expand to more three-year-olds. So we'll be able to expand that care, but there are a couple things we have to continue to do. One is we need more actual providers. We live in a childcare desert where it's too many neighborhoods that don't have access to providers at all. So we wanna help ramp up and scale more providers. That includes things like in downtown Denver using vacant office spaces to be able to retrofit those for childcare facilities so folks bringing their kids downtown can place them there. It means training more people who wanna enter into being childcare providers. And that's a great pipeline for us to get them to become teachers. But we have to be able to both train those people, prepare them, pay them, and get them access to sites where they can teach. All right, this next question focuses on the economy, and this comes from Denver 7 anchors Nicole Brady and Brian Sanders. Brian and I have both reported on efforts to restore Denver's business districts, including Lodo, Cherry Creek, and downtown. We've heard from the community concerned about crime, safety, also how the move to remote and hybrid work is decreasing foot traffic in business. So our question to the candidates, what three specific ideas do you have to help revive Denver's business districts? And Mike, we'll let you start. Uh, I do think you mentioned some of the most important parts of reviving business, which is when I talk to business leaders today, particularly about downtown, they'll say, and my employees felt the same way. They're worried about their safety in downtown. So for me, that's a start of making sure we put more first responders onto the street. I've come out to say we should put 200 more first responders. That means, yes, officers that are out walking beats and being visible in neighborhoods to talk to business leaders and residents. It means mental health and paramedics when we need those. I think that's an important step. The second is getting folks who are unhoused access to housing and services and stability. That's really important. But the third is encouraging people to come back uh, downtown, particularly to work. That means doing things like I've proposed partnering with business to make commuting to and from downtown free for commuters on public transit, light rail and bus lines, true for uh, free for college kids or students, uh, supportive of seniors. So people, it's easier to get to and from downtown. You can have childcare facilities now downtown, and you know you have a safer, more stable downtown. Those things will make the biggest difference in getting a downtown that's gonna be vibrant again. Kelly. I've committed to end, <clears throat> sorry, unsanctioned camping my first year. And this is just so important that people have a safer place to be, uh, housing and shelter that they can be at. I think that will help our downtown tremendously. Uh, but I also believe we have to start to focus on increasing residential downtown, where we get people 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And today we are losing office buildings and other cities have found transitioning some of those office buildings to residential really helps uh, restore the vibrancy of your downtown. I also believe we have to focus on the completion of the mall. There's no question that that construction is impacting uh, your experience downtown and feelings of isolation. So I'd really focus to make sure we stay on time and maybe earlier so we can complete that construction and start to rebuild and create the events that invite people to be part of our downtown again. Thank you both. Joe has our next question. Mayor Hancock has said remote work has promoted employment and retention in the city but he's enacted in a policy that requires many city employees to be at their desks at least three days a week. Do you feel that city employees should be part of the solution to promote economic activity downtown? And Kelly, you're first. Thanks. Uh, I think when I think about uh, the responsibility of the mayor in terms of the workforce, it's about how can we best deliver customer service, deliver, deliver results. And so I will really focus on every single decision being about supporting uh, our customers, and that looks different. We have a number of city employees who come in every single day, they didn't get a break during the pandemic. We have others who maybe have flexibility. Uh, there's no question that employees are downtown, probably about the same amount that our private sector employees are downtown today. I think we could look at how could we uh, increase the times, um, the work locations even, even if it's not in the office. And I think this has to be true for our private sector and public sector, because the public sector alone is not gonna be able to revitalize our downtown. But I think together with strategies that bring workers here uh, for uh, funner activities, things we do before and after work, 
I think could also help revitalize it. Thank you, Mike. Uh, yes, I do believe we want to encourage more workers to come to work downtown. That means private sector businesses. That means our own workers. Uh, and I'll tell you, this is not just a, it'd be nice to have more people in downtown. This is a fundamental equity issue for the city. If you are someone who works at a, as a server at a restaurant and you don't have a lunch shift anymore, that's a huge impact on your income every month. If you're someone who works at a retail shop downtown and you don't have an eight to four shift anymore during the day, that's a huge impact on your family's income. And we know a lot of those jobs that don't have the privilege of being able to be remote are relying on a lot of us to be able to be back in person to not just revive the vibrance of downtown, but to make sure those people whose jobs depend on us uh, have the ability to get that access to services. So I see our city employees, certainly the folks that I appoint and the city employees we work with as part of that call to service. Our fundamental mission is to help revive this city. And part of that work for us is to make sure we revive downtown. Of course, there are still ways to have flexibility and figure out what people need department by department. Uh, but we will push to try to make sure all of the city's employees can come and help us revive downtown and we'll be part of that. Okay, we're gonna shift gears a little bit. We're gonna do a round of yes or no. So please, if you would, both just answer yes or no, starting with, do you support Denver residents paying for trash service through the city's new fee? Yes. Yes. Do you support ranked choice voting? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Should Denver add pickleball courts? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Should Denver change its snow plowing policy? <laughs> yes. No. Would you support using taxpayer money to build a new stadium for the Broncos? No. Only with a vote. Are the Nuggets going to make history and go all the way? Yes. <laughs> of course they are. And how about that game last night? That was a good game. All right, with that, we are going to take a break, and we will be right back with the candidates.